The national media loves Oregon, and I love that they love Oregon. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your daily source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. As the playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to, but this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Oregon's schedule works out very well for all this national media love. And what kind of role does Jay Harris have going into the season? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I will uh, address all of that on today's show. But when I say the national media is all over Oregon, this is not a local Oregon beat reporter. This is not me. This is not a fan podcast or anything of the sorts. Uh, Heather Dinich wrote a piece in ESPN laying out that Oregon has the second best odds in her view or the numbers that ESPN is uh, using to compute the data, crunch the numbers and such, that they have the second most likely chance to make the playoff. Number one is Georgia. Number three is Texas. Number four is Ohio State. You can put those teams in a lot of different orders, but Oregon is going to be a preseason consensus top five team, which has happened in my lifetime. You go back to, I think, Helfrich's second year, Oregon was a preseason top five team. There have been other seasons where, you know, top 10, which is, you know, not all that different, but cracking in that top five, being number two, boy, that's crazy. And I'll get back to Dinich's piece in uh, just a moment. But the uh, the other, by the way, Oregon's never been number one in the uh, college football playoff era. They have not been in the college football playoff rankings ranked as the number one team at any point. But with 25 days to go until game one, I'm going to keep putting that plug in every episode at a random spot just so you realize, oh my gosh, we're that close because we are. Uh, Brett McMurphy of the Action Network, who was at both Big Ten and SEC media days, he's been around college football for mm, a hot minute. He, uh, he picked Oregon as his preseason number one team. Look, I'm an Oregon fan. I'm, I'm hoping that's obvious by now. I would not pick Oregon to be the preseason number one team. If you ask me right now to make Spencer's preseason college football top 25, would Oregon be in the top five? Yep. Would Oregon be number one? Nope. I would not move Georgia out of that spot. But the reason I think Oregon fans should like that level of attention and that level of hype is twofold. Number one, Oregon has worked to deserve that sort of national respect. And when you are trying to get better rankings, when you're trying to get more attention, when you're trying to push for you know higher ranked recruiting classes and getting players all that stuff feeds into a narrative around your football team, around the football program that Dan Lanning is running. And all of that stuff contributes in a way that has not solely, but certainly helped keep a lot of the big brands on top. When you are a preseason top 10 team, and I know where everyone likes to go, what about Texas A&M? What about Ohio State? What about Alabama? Isn't that where you want Oregon to be? I understand the trepidation that a lot of fans have about getting really hyped about a season or putting a lot of outside noise and attention around a football team. And should they be, you know, considered this highly and should they be ranked that high and all this sort of stuff? But isn't that where you want to get to? When was the last time? The ultimate goal here is, of course, for Oregon to win a national championship and God willing, several national championships. But let's let's start with going for that first one, which they absolutely have a chance to do this season, by the way. How many times has a team that is not regularly seen as a preseason top 5, 10 team, that doesn't consistently recruit in the top 5 or 10, 
where they've got that sort of respect from the national media. I'm not saying that they determine who is actually going to be good because they overrate or underrate teams all the time. But when was the last time you had a national champion emerge that going into a year was just flying under the radar? You know who flies under the radar a lot? Utah. Utah is a program that has been an incredibly high floor institution. Oklahoma State, they, you know, they're in the same conference now, by the way, because college football is weird, wild, and crazy. But those two programs have an incredibly high floor. They get underrated. They get overlooked a little bit. If you want to have that chip off your shoulder, that's great. That's great for your program. You know how many uh, playoff appearances those teams made combined? Zero. Did not get there. Had some really good teams. Oregon robbed Utah of a playoff spot back in 2019. But... This is the sort of conversation you should want Oregon to be in. You should want them to look at the Ducks and respect what Oregon's doing out West. Because teams that are out West, this is part of the reason I'm sad the Pac-12 uh, has gone by the wayside, RIP, and good luck Oregon State, Washington State with the rebuild and such. But there was always an element of East Coast bias, SEC bias, anti-West Coast bias. Have you heard any of those terms before? The fact that Oregon has worked to be in this position, I think, is a testament to all that has gone in to building up Oregon football into the national spectacle that it is. So I think getting that sort of respect, even if I don't think Oregon should be the preseason number one team, maybe McMurphy is just trolling a little bit. He doesn't seem like the type of guy to do that. I haven't met him personally, but he doesn't seem like he, he's that sort of individual. He just might be really high on Oregon. But would you rather have a team that might not actually be national championship caliber, but has that chip off the shoulder and, oh, you're overlooking us, we're flying under the radar. When do those teams win championships? You know who's had a lot of hype over the years? Nick Saban's teams. Ohio State, Jim Harbaugh's teams the last couple of years. 2019 LSU got some big hype and big attention right away. So that's the first reason that I, I really like it. The second reason is it's reinforcing what we are all seeing, which is Dan Lanning is running a high level of operation. This is not me gassing you up or Brian Smith coming on here every week and saying, yeah, he's trying to build Georgia North. He's trying to build an SEC program out West and he is on the path to, to doing so. He's succeeding in doing just that. This is what he is actually accomplishing and is actually capable of. Does Do the results on the field have to follow? Duh yes obviously i love when people act like they are proposing a revolutionary concept well dan lanning he's got to win a conference championship holy crap is that a goal no way i didn't pff, mind blown unbelievable ran great insight never heard that one before so <laughs> anyway that was unusually sarcastic for me on on this particular show but for those in, I, I, I just, I see that stuff get thrown out there so, so often and it drives me kind of insane, but you know what? That's okay. That's the job and, and career that, that I've signed up for. But I like that Oregon is getting this sort of attention because this is where I want Oregon to be every single year. I want to have high hopes. I don't want to go into a year thinking, yeah, if we win seven, eight games, it'll be fun. Like, no, no, no. We, many of us, many of you have been rooting for the Ducks longer than I have been alive. And you haven't seen Oregon win a national championship yet. Yet, Yeah, I want that to happen. Yeah, I want people to respect what Oregon does. I want it to have the sort of pedigree in the portal and on the recruiting trail that you can go out there and be a part of the first national championship at Oregon. So that's why I like the national media hype. That's, that's why I think it is good. But Oregon's schedule is another reason that I am excited for the Ducks' upcoming season. And I'll talk about that coming up next. after we talk about FanDuel, of course, because I love sports, not just college football. I love a lot of sports, not all sports, but just about all sports. I love, I love them so much. Love and like, I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like I want them to. The good news is that FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime that I am in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Oregon bets are readily available. They've got a minus one line against Ohio State, 
minus three and a half line at Michigan, minus 19 and a half against Washington. Boy, I hope Oregon covers that number. That'd be a good day. That, that would ease the minds of a lot of Oregon fans if Dan Lanning covers that number. If you think they will, you can go bet it over at FanDuel. They've got everything you want for college football as well. Head over to FanDuel.com, start making the most out of your summer, and get ready for the college football season too. FanDuel.com, FanDuel official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Very dehydrated, recording this show, played 36 holes of golf today, drank a lot of water, still wasn't quite enough. But alas, I soldier on as always. And no, it is not unusual for me to play 36 holes of golf in a day, because what else am I going to do throughout the day when there's no play-by-play? So, Oregon's schedule works out incredibly favorably in 2024. And I don't think that was perfect English, but you get the point that I am making. I don't know that you could concoct a schedule that works out as well, given the teams that Oregon's playing. Having to play Ohio State and Michigan, who are going to be preseason top 10 teams, I think that praise for Michigan's like slightly too high. I think they're more in the 10 to 15 range than they are in the 5 to 10 range. But we'll, we'll see when the AP poll comes out. They were number eight in uh, the, the AP coaches poll. And the coaches poll and the AP poll usually don't differ all that much. So Michigan being on the road, and Ohio State at home, that's a massive, massive split for Oregon. Because I have not made my official record prediction, nor will I for quite some time here on the show, but Oregon's schedule works out not not just well with those games, but they have a Friday night game before Ohio State, so they get an extra day of rest, and they get eased into Big Ten conference play. If you look around the country at these realigned leagues and teams that are going into new conferences and the first look at their new schedule, there are some, like Utah, for instance, that you look at and say, hmm, oh, they, got, they got some breaks. They got, they got an opportunity to win some football games. And then there's Florida, which is not in a new conference. But you look at their schedule and go, ooh, yikes, oof. Or how about USC? You know who USC's first Big Ten game is against? Michigan. That's their first Big Ten game. Yeah, that's right. They start with LSU, They start, then they play Utah State, and then they go at Michigan. Those are the first three games of the year for USC. You better come out guns blazing and firing on all cylinders. You compare that to Oregon's schedule. They've got a tune-up game, week one against Idaho. I will be there at Autzen Stadium. Very excited to be there because I haven't been to Autzen in about seven years. I've seen Oregon in person several times, but not at Autzen, so I'm stoked about that. Then they play Boise State. Now that game is going to be uh, a a, a difficult-ish game. I I, I think Oregon's going to win. I think they're finally going to buck the Boise State trend that they've had over the years. No pun intended that Boise State are uh, the Broncos. But I, I think that that game could be like Washington State this past year. You kind of start slow. You don't get into the feel. Then you settle down. You win by 20 points or so, and uh, it's never really close at the end. You don't play Michigan until later in the year. You don't have to go to Wisconsin until later in the year. Now, that might not actually be a break. That might be the the worst scheduling break Oregon has on uh, this 2024 slate of games because going to Wisconsin in November, a little bit tougher weather-wise than going to Wisconsin in September or even early October. So that's the one game I look at and go, hmm. If you wanted to make it easier, you'd put that game first and have UCLA be at the end of November. But still, it it works out really well for the Ducks, that their toughest road games are at Michigan, at Wisconsin, and the other ones are just kind of, eh, they're just just kind of games. And they don't have uh, Penn State on there, they don't have USC on there, and they have Washington at home. So I, I think the schedule works out really, really well. And that's part of the reason the national media really like the Ducks. So going back to that uh, take from uh, Heather, or the piece rather from uh, Heather Dinich recently, you know, she talked about the transition from Bo Nix to Dylan Gabriel, and that'll be uh, pretty seamless. I think people uh, agree on that. I don't think Gabriel's quite at Bo Nix's level, but he's the best quarterback in the Big Ten, and there's no one unless Dylan Rayola is amazing as a true freshman. I don't think there's going to be anyone else that's as productive. Maybe Drew Aller at Penn State. You know, he's also an experienced guy. I, I'd rather take Dylan Gabriel. I've seen Drew Aller in big games. I've seen Dylan Gabriel in big games. I'm taking Gabriel plus small guys for the win. But 
uh, what she said the committee will like when evaluating Oregon's resume. And one of the reasons that uh, she thinks Oregon has a 76%, according to ESPN's FPI, chance to make the college football playoff and a 12.8% chance to win the national title. They're plus 900 odds, uh, which is one of the five highest in the entire country. Uh, her piece says what the bit, what the committee will like big 10 road wins against ranked opponents. November is when Oregon will truly feel like it's in the big 10 when it goes to Ann Arbor and camp Randall stadium at Wisconsin with home games against Maryland and Washington. November is the month that should define the ducks place in the playoff. I agree that that month is going to define a lot. The Ohio state game is what she has listed as the ducks toughest test. 100% agree. I don't think there's any argument there. The other aspect she wrote when evaluating teams in this piece is what the committee won't like. A September 7th home loss to Boise State. That could complicate things inside the committee meeting room if Boise State wins the Mountain West Conference and is the panel's highest ranked champion from the group of five conferences. It's a very plausible scenario as ESPN Analytics projects Boise State to have the best chance to represent the group of five in the playoff. So does head to head matter? And you get into that sort of conversation. But I think Oregon's going to take care of business against Boise State. They're the favorites in the Mountain West. This is not just a good, you know, solid Boise State team. This is not the Chris Peterson era Boise State teams, but they got some players. Their backfield is Malachi Nelson, former five-star quarterback, and Ashton Genty, who had power four offers all over the place, but decided to stay with Boise State, which I personally uh, really, really respect. So I I think that that is why Oregon has such a great schedule and those are just a couple elements you know the the, the relatively easy start like five and0 should be no problem it, it shouldn't just be a five and0 start it should be a cruising five and0 start so uh, I, I think that's where 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 or where I feel with regards to Oregon schedule and, and how they'll navigate I, I think Dinich is pretty spot on there. A home loss to Boise State, that'd be pretty punitive. Even if they're the highest ranked G5 champion, that'd be pretty damning, I think, in the eyes of the committee. If Oregon is an at-large team, they'd probably get a much lower seed because if Oregon is as the media is hyping them up to be and as, frankly, I have hyped them up to be, Boise State shouldn't be able to contend with Oregon. The highest ranked group of five conference champion should look like what Liberty did against Oregon in the Fiesta Bowl, 45 to 6. Now, I don't think that Liberty team was as good as SMU was when Preston Stone, their quarterback, was healthy. Like, they went on to lose in the uh, the Boston Bowl, the one that gets played at Fenway Park. They lost to a 6-6 six and six Boston College team. They didn't have their quarterback. He's back healthy this year. They were 11-2 and two American Athletic Conference champs. That's the first or second best group of five league in, in the country. So I don't think Oregon played the best from the G5, but Liberty was decently good. But if Boise State comes to town and Oregon wins that game, you know, and it looks like that, 45-6, to six, then suddenly that I don't think radically shifts the committee's view of Oregon. I, I think just legitimizes the hype in that moment. It, it, it's what you can accomplish in that game. You, you have more to lose than you have to gain, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to be gained for Oregon in, in that week two matchup. So uh, if Oregon wins every game and you know that of course gets them uh, into the playoff, then all this hype will be lived up to. But th- this this schedule, I cannot drive this point home enough. This schedule works out. You don't have a non-conference game that scares you. Oregon's about a 20-point favorite at Oregon State. They're going to be a big favorite at home against Boise State, and I don't think Boise can go into Austin and win. And then you have Idaho. And then you start at UCLA in Big Ten play. So you you have a non-conference slate where you should not play a one-possession game. And then you start in conference play with two games that also shouldn't be close. You have rebuilding Michigan State and rebuilding UCLA with first-year head coaches. Jonathan Smith is good. He's at home because Oregon plays them in Eugene. And you have Deshaun Foster, who I think is going to have a rough first year. Almost sneezed, was able to hold it in. I'm kind of proud of myself for that. I was ready to have the mute button, hit edit, didn't have to do it. Deshaun Foster, I think, is going to be in for a very, very rough year. You get the extra day of rest because that Michigan State game is on a Friday. I think Oregon's going to be in a really, really good spot going into that Ohio State game. And uh, like Dennis said in her piece, it's going to be their toughest test. 
but they're going to be feeling about as good as they get. They should be feeling about as good as they can be going into that October 12th showdown. I cannot wait. Football is very close. Jay Harris is an interesting guy. So Jay Harris is probably Oregon's number three running back. I think. Possibly. We'll talk about that coming up next. After we talk about eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. They have superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors, they've got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash, duh. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to those good old USA customers. So we're hopping into the mailbag to wrap up today's show. YouTube comments or X, formerly known as Twitter, at S. McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. Those are ways to get into the mailbag. If you want priority access and all sorts of other perks as well, go join the flock over at Subtext. Link in the description below wherever you listen to or watch this show where there's a free 14-day trial and you get plenty of perks. I assure you, I do my best to make it worthwhile. This from King Sabo 7 How do you think Jay Harris is coming along so far? Do you think he fits the scheme and how will they possibly use him? I was pretty impressed with Jay Harris. If you go back and watch what he did in the spring game, he made true freshmen look like true freshmen. Kamar Mathudi twice was on the wrong end of a Jay Harris stiff arm. Dude is nasty. He he is physically ready. He's in the 6'1", 6'2", 215 pound range. Like he is a big bruising back. You ever watch The Longest Yard? I watched it not that long ago, which is why I thought of this. But the guy they put in at fullback, the guards team, who they put in at fullback, who they're handing the ball to, and he's just plowing guys over, and then eventually Swatowski punches him in the face. It's a great scene. Great movie overall. Fantastic movie, The Longest Yard. That's kind of what Jay Harris is. He's not a fullback. Like He's a true running back. He He's a guy that demonstrated in the spring game against high-level college competition that he is going to be able to run between the tackles and outside the tackles. He is not a one-trick pony. You compare that to a guy whose size he is similar to, Cyrus Habibi Likio, that was a short yardage guy. And Cyrus was very good at that. And Jordan James was a very good short yardage back. Cyrus was great in the short yardage spots. I never watched his game and thought, you know, if Oregon needed him to be a number one back, he could do it. You know, I think that 2019 Washington game was really the only time where he had carries that weren't just short yardage spots. Maybe there were a couple times in the Pac-12 title game, but overall, like that's what he did. He excelled at his role. Jay Harris can fill that role because he is bigger than, he's taller than Jordan James and he's taller than Noah Whittington. He's got a little bit more size to him. If you want to put him in there in in short yardage, smash smash mouth situations, I'm here for it. I think he can serve that role. If you go look at that 2022 backfield, Oregon had four running backs that that were used in in various ways throughout the year. Technically five, but Byron Cardwell faded out of that rotation fairly quickly. It was Bucky Irving, Noah Whittington. Those were your lead two guys. Then you had Jordan James as the short yardage back. And you had Sean Dollars as kind of a scat pass catching back who was in there in certain formations, like they used him in 21 personnel, uh, two backs, one uh, tight end with uh, with Noah Whittington. They'd put Whittington and Dollars back there, one guy lead block for the other, and it worked really well. I won't be surprised if Jay Harris has that sort of package because he's physically ready and he looks really good and he can do a lot of things. You know, is he a superb pass catcher? I don't know that we know, but I don't think Oregon would need him in that situation. You know Jordan James can catch the ball, and you know Noah Whittington can catch the ball. So if if you have two backs who you feel can catch a ball out of the backfield, you can have a guy. I mean, Jordan James in that short yardage role in his true freshman season, he didn't need to catch the ball. He, he didn't need to be, you know, uh, some multifaceted back. Like, 
j- just get some exposure, get some carries, and be effective. And I think he can uh, certainly be that. Now, what I wonder is whether this, the coaching staff and Rashad Samples, new running backs coach, feels like that's the best course of action. Because Jordan James, we know, is prolific in short yardage spots. Like Whittington's good, but James is better. And like, are, are you going to take him off the field? Is Harris good enough to, to earn those sorts of carries? That's what I don't know. But I don't think he, he needs to be a, a one a one trick pony sort of guy where you just give him the ball in third and one. Like if you know Whittington's dinged up and 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 Jordan James needs a break, I feel pretty good giving Jay Harris a couple of carries on the drive uh, until James can get back that back back out there on the field. I, I mean he, you know anybody that can make a, a blue chip fr- true freshman look like he's not quite ready to play football yet. Yet that's a guy who's ready to be a starting caliber player. And he was a D2 All-American. So it's not like he's new to playing the position or that he hasn't played football for very long. Like, no, he just hasn't been at the highest level, but he looks really prepared to do that. So I could see him having that short yardage role. I think he can do more and be a part of, you know, if they bring back that 21 personnel and, you know, run those sweeps like Jay Harris is a lead blocker. Gosh, he could kick people's butts. He could lay out a corner, a safety, take on a linebacker. Like he's a big dude. He, he, he is a big, big dude. And I think there are a couple different ways that, that they could use him. I, I expect him to get out there every now and then at the very least. And, you know, if, if, God forbid Jordan James or Noah Whittington go down with an injury. I mean, Whittington's coming off an injury. So, you know, you never know. Some guys are able to rehab those injuries and stay healthy better than others. Hopefully Whittington's able to, because I'm a big Noah Whittington fan. I don't know that Jane Lamar is automatically the number three back. Like maybe he is to get more bulk carries because he's closer to, you know, a Noah Whittington with his running style. I think he's more like a bulky Travis Dye. And Jay Harris is kind of Royce Freeman-ish. That, that's that's what he reminds me of. He, he's Royce Freeman-ish where he's got good feet. He can run outside. He's got some speed. But he's a big bruising back who you can give the ball to in, in a variety of spots. So I'm curious to see how he gets used. I love the question. Keep him coming. And that's going to be it for today's show. I had other mailbag questions for today's show. And um, yeah, I wanted to make sure they got a full answer. I didn't want to shortchange you so Those questions will be on tomorrow's show. You'll just have to tune in. Thanks for making this your first listen. Make Locked On College Football your second. I'm over there keeping you up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth. Realignment, coaching carousel, the portal, and everything you need to know for the season, getting you ready all day, every day. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.